Okay, assalamu alaikum, bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Welcome everybody to uh, our favorite session, our favorite activity on a Saturday. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Um, I just, I, you know, we've been talking here, um, we had a reflection group last night um, where we talked about Surah Luqman and we had some other conversations, um, I know it's a couple of surahs ago, but I also know that because we go very quickly, um, it's hard for people to keep up um, and oftentimes people don't have the benefit of, of having a group to, to discuss um, some of the issues. But I thought I would share, uh, it's really interesting because obviously Luqman um, talks about parenting and the importance of the family and you know the lessons that Luqman shared with his son um, and the wisdom of you know raising his his child um, and you know this um, brought to my attention you know obviously we have a teenager in the house he's 16 and um, you know we were talking about everything from um, you know the, the family structure Interestingly, um, you know, marriage rates of, or failure rates are very high, both in the general population, obviously, but among Muslims as well. And, um, you know, you can't help but think about the environment that your children or your teenagers are growing up in and the impact of that and what our role as Muslims in creating a stable family home environment are, how important that is for, you know, obviously the, the development of our children into, you know, um, really healthy um, adults. And, um, you know, there's there's obviously a lot of work to do, but um, I wanted to share, actually this is kind of different than usual, but I wanted to share a book that I'm reading. It's called The Teenage Brain, <laughs> and it's written by a neuroscientist. And, you know, because obviously as we are entering, you know, uh, Mito is in high school and, you know, this is, um, a critical time you know obviously like social media is such a huge impact friends are such a huge impact there are just so many you know things to be worried about um, that I, I just felt like I wanted to know more about why my teenager is a teenager and how his brain is developing and what that actually means and I actually was really surprised even just to get in through the introduction of this book it's written by a neuroscientist who she herself had two sons and um, they were reaching the high school age same age as Mito and she had always studied um, brain activity among babies, but she decided to take it upon herself to um, do research about the teenage brain because that um, field of study was quite underdeveloped. And so she wrote a book about her discoveries, and it's fascinating because um, you know people had always thought that you kind of are a baby and you develop, and that's you know that's it, and then you automatically become an adult. And there's this in-between zone where you're just rebellious, and then you know it's just like you're overacting from hormones. But there's so much more of a complicated picture to this story that actually even things like, you know, a teenage body has the same number of hormones as a young adult. It's not an issue of the amount of hormones, but it's the issue of how, you know, this body is changing and preparing to grow and how it reacts to these hormones over the first time. But, you know, what was striking to me is just, um, you know, like, let me just share um, for people who haven't caught up with us and have not been... Um, you know, are not caught up yet at Luqman. Um, among the, the wisdom that was shared by Luqman with his son, um, in my um, paraphrasing, is that um, he told, uh, you know, and these we sort of take as lessons for his son, but lessons to us as Muslims in general, is gratitude to God, that uh, an awareness that God has knowledge of everything, holding on to prayer, actively seeking to pursue and establish goodness while resisting what is wrong, so enjoining, the, uh, enjoining what is good and forbidding what is evil, um, persevering in hardship, fighting one's own arrogance, um, avoiding our desire to appear impressive, um, being humble, treating others with mercy, kindness, and goodness, and avoiding yelling and screaming. These are sort of the takeaways from our delving into Luqman. And again, it's like my paraphrasing of, you know, trying to think about like how this was conveyed in the surah to understanding what that means and what I might say to my son. And I think as a, as a parent, you can't help but look at this advice and think about what did you tell your child? Have you told your child these things? How have you um, been successful in imparting some of these lessons? But Building from that, I think it's also incumbent upon us to understand, you know, some of the science of our age and the research that has been done 
And, you know, like this, this book about the teenage brain really hammers home what I think a lot of parents tend to do is just to get frustrated and just to assume that this is a phase or just to, you know, yell and scream or try to, you know, put more restrictions in place. Um, without necessarily taking the time to read and understand like what actually developmentally is happening um, with this brain, with this body, what are the, the types of things that you know influence this type of behavior. And I just I wanted to share this book again. It's called The Teenage Brain and it's Francis E. Jensen. Um, and the, I just wanted to share a little bit of this because I feel like you know th these when, when you have children, you realize how, vulnerable you become because you're really only as good as how your children are and you know teenage years are so difficult and it's and so if you find that you are struggling because your teenager is going through hardship um, you know that undermines the stability of, of your your household and um, this is really difficult and so I just wanted to highlight that you know the first step is to just try and learn more and understand more and that can help inform how you address certain issues so this, I just wanted to read the short part, which is, um, you know, from the, the first chapter, which is that, um, you know, while hormones can explain some of what is going on, there's much more at play in the teenage brain, where new connections between the brain areas are being built, and many chemicals, especially neurotransmitters, um, are in flux. And this is why adolescence is a time of true wonder because of the flexibility and growth of the brain, adolescents have a window of opportunity with an increased capacity for remarkable accomplishments. But flexibility, growth, and exuberance are a double-edged sword because an open and excitable brain can also be adversely affected by stress, drugs, chemical substances, and any number of changes in the environment. And because of an adolescent's often overactive brain, those influences can result in problems dramatically more serious than they are for adults. Um, you know, so the, the point is um, just that, you know, we have so many resources, so many ways to understand um, what is going on. And, um, you know, I, you know, I've seen enough of my share of people yelling at their teenagers. And I, you know, and knowing from even Mito's friends, how many you know, of his friends are coming from broken homes or you know, difficult environments. I, just, I feel like this is something that um, we as Muslims should you know, really be better at understanding on ourselves and, you know, and, and especially since here we, we're trying to um, focus on education and critical thinking just to, to turn to sort of deeper knowledge to understand our situation and hopefully that can help navigate and help some of the problems um, in families. Um, so it's, it's not, you know, uh, a source of despair or, or um, depression. So anyway, that is all I wanted to share. So anyone who has teenagers, my prayers are with you. We're in the same boat. And inshallah, may Allah make your journey with your teenagers smooth, inshallah. So, okay. Looking forward to another amazing session, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Subhanallah al-Ali al-Azim. اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على محمد وعلى اله واصحابه وتواب احسانا الى الى يوم الدين اللهم اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي يا رب العالمين. ان شاء الله today we will talk about سورة الزخرف. Um, before I I jump into this. Uh, I um, want to underscore again for anyone that listens to this tafsir, um, do your best, your best to support this project. Uh, Surah Al Qamar has not been adopted yet. Um, I think. Anyone that adopts a surah, um, um, their um, uh, may Allah, the reward with Allah, inshallah, will be enormous. Um, surah Al Qamar is a, is a surah that we've talked about, and it's a very powerful surah. And um, if um, it, it should have. It should have a competition. I mean, there, there, there should be a, a, a demand for adopting the surah right away. 
So I, I urge you to adopt any of the available soar, but especially the soar that we, we cover. Um, I can't imagine for I can't imagine for a Muslim. I just I can't imagine for a Muslim something more worthwhile than studying the Quran, teaching the Quran, researching the Quran. Um, and knowing knowing the field, knowing what is being taught about the Quran, whether from a Muslim perspective or an Orientalist perspective, uh, the field is stagnant. And alhamdulillah, what is being offered here is a breath of fresh air. And if Muslim, the Muslim Ummah was in a healthier situation, um, an effort like this would not have to repeatedly appeal for support. Uh, rise up to the challenge. Rise up to the challenge. Support the future of your Ummah by supporting the Qur'an. Okay. Surah Al-Zukhruf. Um, we always start out by situating the surah, and I'm going to do that, inshallah. But I'm going to also explain something about the way I'm going to approach the surah and why. Um, surah Al-Zukhruf is among the Hawameen. And we've talked about the Hawameen before. The surah that start with Hamim. And I told you that I've noticed that the Hawameen um, are surah that have a, a common thread to them. They, they are the sword that lay out the heart and pulse of the Quran. Um, the very soul of the Quran. And, um, and, and that's uh, naturally makes Surah Al-Zukhruf a very important surah. Um, but although among the Hawamim it was revealed after Surat al Isra and after Surat al Luqman and after Saba, um, and we haven't done Surat al Shura, but it was revealed after Surat al-Shura. Most authorities agree that it was the Surah revealed right after Surat al-Shura. So you have Luqman, Saba, Zumar, Ghafir, Fusilat, Shura, and then Zukhruf. Um, and shortly before Ijathiyah, and we've talked about a jathi. So it is revealed towards the late Mecca period. Um, and it and parts of the surah addresses things that transpired in Mecca that we can track. Um, and we can say, okay, well, this event took place, it involved these individuals, and it took place at this time, 
And so we can pin down to the best of our ability uh, the time of revelation. Um, but being part of the Hawamim and considering the message that Surah to Surah convey, sorry, Surah to Zuhruf conveys, one would have expected it to be revealed earlier. One would have expected it to be revealed with Surah al Dukhan um, around that time towards the middle of the Mecca period. So it's interesting that it is revealed after al Isra, although thematically it would make sense for it to be revealed before al Isra. Um, and this enters into the way I went about analyzing Surah al Zukhruf and understanding the message of Surah al Zukhruf. Okay, so that is one, one point. A further point with Surah al Zukhruf is that. There is a, a bit of a challenge about how to um, present the material. If you, the, the traditional approach, in other words, the, the approach that you find, find in all the tafsir. And in this, in this case, in the case of Surah Al-Zukhruf, whether um, Nakli Tafasir, uh, Tafasir that like Tabari and Ibn Kathir that rely on transmission, or Sufi-esque Tafasir uh, like Ibn Ajiba and um, uh, Jilani and others, uh, or more rationally inclined, inclined tafsir like Razi or Zamakhshari. Of course, Zamakhshari is rational slash linguistic. Um, these uh, tafsir that rely on analysis of the grammar. Um, in this case, in Surah Al-Zukhruf, you actually don't get a lot of variety in what they're telling you about Surah Al-Zukhruf. So we, we can go through Surah Al-Zukhruf and that, that makes it a bit easier to deal with Surah Al-Zukhruf because we can talk about what, the, what everyone more or less agrees. Uh, the, the themes are, the issues are, the subject matter is, and so on. Um, But what the way I what I derive from Surah Al Zukhruf and my approach to Surah Al Zukhruf is sufficiently different that it, there is a challenge. Do you uh, do you present this material? as you are presenting the traditional material or the traditional approach, or do you present the traditional approach, complete that, and then present your own approach? Um, and would that, would that involve redundancy and repetition that you normally would like to avoid? So, in this case, I'm going to do um, Something I haven't done with other sort um, in in the in this particular way is that I'm going to just go through first, and I will go through the surah, talking about what the scholarship offers 
meaning what all the tafsir literature offers about Surah Al-Zukhruf. And I will reserve my approach to the Surah to the very end. So we'll, we'll finish that, and then I'll say, okay, we're, we're done with this, and then I'm going to tell you um, how I understand Surah Al-Zukhruf. Um, and Allah knows best. Allah knows best. Okay. So by now we're accustomed to the discussions about Hamim, these letters. Um, the um, uh, we've talked about those who said that it is part of spelling out Ar Rahman that all the Hawamim spell out Ar Rahman. Um, there is a further perspective that I, I haven't, I don't think I've ever mentioned, um, that said Hamim in particular um, refers to Allah swearing by, with Wahayati wa Mulki, with by my existence and Mulki, my kingdom. And that it is the initials for Haya and Mulk. Um, and that perspective is typically found in Sufi esque tafsir uh, that don't refer to a transmission. In other words, that they don't refer, refer to a tradition that has been transmitted um, from the Prophet or the companions or Ali Bayt but that say that this came, this realization came to them as a fat, uh, sort of through prayer uh, and reflection on what Hamim is and they were inspired. That came to them as an inspiration. And as you know, the traditional tafsir normally just say we don't know what these letters at the beginning of the surah mean and they move on. Okay. So, well, Kitab al Mubin by Allah swears by this book, the clarifying book. Al Mubin, the book that clarifies and differentiates between falsehood and truth. Of course, addressed in Mecca to, in the context, as often the Quran does, it affirms that this revelation was use the Arabic language to display the miracle of Allah's revelation. So you may reflect, so that you may ponder by being masters of that language and the pride, the, 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 as we've said before, Arabs were unusual because uh, unlike the Persians, unlike the Egyptians, um, unlike the civilizations around them, the civilizations that centered on fertile uh, land, um, in other words, rivers and agriculture, uh, these were a people that had no other significant accomplishment other than their language, which is a very unusual historical thing. Um, nomadic people, they might have a lot of mythology, but it's never written down and it eventually, if that mythology doesn't move on 
to literary cultures, settled literary cultures that have established civilizations around uh, water, rivers. Uh, the mythology of nomadic tribes disappears. It dies with history. No one ever knows anything about it. So the, extent, the only mythology of nomadic people that have survived is that mythology that moved from the nomadic tribes, which are typically illiterate tribes, non-literary tribes, to areas where there is settled civilization, agriculture, industry, settlement, and so, but it is never transmitted um, per se, it's never transmitted literally. Whenever the nomadic methodology moves to literary cultures, uh, literary cultures develop it, they, uh, they adopt it, they, um, um, uh, they co-opt it, they, they make a lot of changes. So we don't even have unadulterated um, mythologies of nomadic people they, because, they, remember, this is the age before there are anthropologists, before there are sociologists, before there are people that travel to nomadic tribes and sit there and study them and write studies about them. Um, and nomadic tribes are, they, they move frequently and they don't leave many inscriptions. Uh, so they're, they're not very interested in inscribing on walls, on stones, on whatever. And even if they write something which is rather rare, it usually disappears uh, because of the nature of the lifestyle itself. So, but the Arabs were unusual because they had all the attributes or all the characteristics of a nomadic people, but they put an enormous amount of energy into their language and they, they had very few kingdoms, very few nobility, very few history or very little history, but they had language, literally just language. Um, would have, if, if, Islam didn't come to these people, would their poetry have been preserved? Um, not very likely. They would have probably become like, you know, the vast majority of nomadic people. We, whatever we know about them, we know about them because other civilizations, civilizations in Persia, in Iraq, in Egypt, uh, in Syria, in Yemen, what they said about them. But we wouldn't have had any much, you know, their poetry would have eventually been forgotten and their language would have only survived uh, as used by Arabs who were settled in, in Yemen or settled in Egypt or settled in Iraq. These Arabs who were allied to superpowers and so on. So when the Quran comes and says that an Arab Quran it is like choosing the hardest challenge to demonstrate its miracle. Uh, you are talking to a people who language with their pride and joy. It was everything. Until now, um, we recently in organizing the library I, I had a chance to look at how many sources, medieval sources, are written on the Arabic language. And of all the languages I studied, this is truly singular. You will not find that number of not not in quantity and not even in extensiveness and even quality. You'll not find it written about Hebrew. You'll not find it written about Arama Aramaic. You'll not find it written about Latin, um, uh, Old English, French. I mean, you name it. It just it, it's a it's a singular phenomenon.
um, just the, the amount of intellectual product about the Arabic language, of course, post-Islam, because after Arabs became illiterary people and started writing things down. And that only happens after the Quran, as I'm sure you know. So, okay, so we've made it an Arab Quran so that you might reflect and ponder. وَإِنَّهُ فِي أُمِّ الْكِتَابِ لَدَيْنَا لَعَلِيٌّ حَكِيمٌ and a reference to this Quran and Umm Kitab, literally it would be translated the mother of the book. And of course that begs the question, what is the mother of the book? And most traditional tafsir, they say the mother of the book is another reference to Lawh al-Mahfuz or the uh, sacred tablet. The, the, which we really don't know in truth what that is, other than Allah makes reference to a sacred um, inheritance from which all the revealed books come. And the only revealed book that came from the sacred tablet or the mother of the book that maintained the integrity of its text is the Quran. Because as we know, the Old Testament was wiped out after the destruction of the first temple and Jews go, go into the uh, period of uh, enslavement and the rabbis try to rewrite the Torah from memory but what they end up writing is, is uh, intermingled with the mythology of the age. So we even, if you read the, the Old Testament, you, it, it, you find clear signs where it, God is described sometimes as being one, being constantly referred to as a king, typical of in the ancient world. Kings and gods, kings are gods and gods are kings. Uh, God is often referred to as being the best among gods. Again, influence of the age. God is sometimes even described as having uh, offspring and the angels. Uh, and it's, I mean, again, if you read the Old Testament, you, you, it's there. Uh, the angels being the offsprings of God, etc., etc. So when the rabbis in the period of captivity try to recall the Torah, it's clear that they write it from a period, from a perspective of people that who are grossly oppressed and they're very upset about this, and they dream of returning to the land from which they were taken into captivity. And so they're obsessed with the idea of being liberated from their oppression and returning to the land from which they uh, were taken. And they are often intermingling recalled memory of the Book of Moses uh, with uh, a lot of the, the mythology of the ancient world. Uh, the New Testament didn't fare much better. The New Testament, uh, you know, there is a, um, by the way, there is a good documentary called, uh, on uh, Amazon, um, called How Jesus Became God. Uh, if, if you're not going to read books on that, uh, just watch the, the documentary. It's, it's a, it's a, it's, it has several parts, but it's a very good documentary, and it talks about the ancient world and the 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 the, the idea of um, the deification of human beings and the humanizing of gods and all the historical forces that led to the corruptions and the text of the New Testament. So it, this was again. This was all a part of human history, the, um, the 
mythological and spectacular and magical period of human history in which people are relying on miracles and not literary cultures for the preservation. This is the history, this is a period before history. Of course, some Orientalists try to say that even Muslims had didn't understand what history is, but I think that's an Orientalist invention. I think the writing of history was invented with Muslims. It is Muslims who are the first people to actually write history as we understand what history to be. Um, I mean, with some rare surviving exceptions from, from the Greeks, but I mean, they're, 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 they're so rare, they, they don't, they don't uh, um, represent a movement um, or a phenomenon. Anyway, um, so this is all significant because, of course, if then, if you're talking about the miracle of Arabic and the Quran coming from the sacred tablet or the Omid Kitab, then it makes perfect sense that the universal faith of monotheism and the final message that comes from that sacred tablet must be protected and preserved from the forces, historical forces, that uh, have plagued the monotheistic message before Islam. Although I said I'm, I'm going to preserve my perspective till the end, this, uh, this is one exception. I tend to understand Umm Kitab a bit differently. I understand Allah al Mahfuz as the sacred tablet, um, but I, I understand the reference to Umm Kitab or the mother of the book as a reference not to the sacred tablet, but as a reference to the core of the book. There are, as we will see inshallah, there are parts of the Quran that were clearly temporal, uh, very historically bounded, uh, contingent. Um, you need a considerable amount of historical knowledge to be able to derive the the moral point of the revelation. If you don't understand the history, you're not going to understand the moral point of the revelation. But that's not Umm Kitab. The Umm Kitab are like the Hawamim, uh, the heart of the revelation. And I don't think it's a coincidence that we have a reference to the Umm Kitab for Surah Zukhruf, a late revelation, yet a revelation that has the characteristics of um, the earlier Surah we talked about um, that are characteristics of the middle, middle Mecca period, like the Dukhan and the Shara and the Naml and the Qasas and so on. Okay. أَفَنَضْرِبُ عَنْكُمُ الذِّكْرَ صَفْحًا إِنْ كُنْتُمْ قَوْمًا مُسْرِفِينَ This is five. The study Quran translates it as, Shall we withdraw the reminder from you altogether for you having been a prodigal people? Um, What it's saying is God knows you are, and this is in the traditional approach, talking again, traditional. God knows that you are a people who are unjust to themselves. Uh, you are a sinners. You are people who are not 
moral, not ethical. And it is put in the form of a rhetorical question. Do you think that we, that just because you are a people on the wrong side, that you are a people who are not good, that God would not send a revelation to you? Now, is there a historical context to this? Um, nothing that is authentically transmit, transmitted. Um, there are reports that some figures, it, it, well, it, there are different reports as who the figures were, but most at least say it was in Mughira, who tells the, the prophet, um, you know, we are, either we are a people of honor um, and uprightness, and if so, we don't need your revelation. Or we are very corrupt people, and if so, then why would God send a prophet to us? So if either we're good people, so we don't need your prophecy, or we're bad people, so God shouldn't bother with us. And there are, you know, reports that say that this, this, is, this revelation is in response to that point. I mean, I, I'm probably that, that comment was made to the Prophet والسلام, but I'm not sure that it's Hassan Gharib. It was transmitted as Hassan Gharib, which is not a very high level of authenticity. But anyway, the point remains the same. Do you think that just because you're inequitous people, that God would not send a prophet to you. Um, as, as we will see, inshallah, in, in my understanding of the surah, this ayah, ayah 5, becomes of great significance. But I'll, I'll leave that till later. وَكَمْ أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ نَبِيٍ فِي الْأَوَّلِينَ وما يأتيهم من نبي إلا كانوا به يستهزئون فأهلكنا أشد 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 منهم بطشا ومضى مثل الأولين. So we've sent many a prophet to people like you, and they met with the same dynamic that the Prophet والسلام, is meeting among you: mockery and denial. And we've destroyed many people who were far more advanced and far stronger than you. And this is typically, you know, the, the, the warning to Quraysh, as we've seen in several swarm now, is, is um, a common theme that... Uh, you don't know if your fate is going to be the same as other people who denied their prophets uh, or not. وَلَئِنْ سَأَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلْقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ لَيَقُولُنَّ خَلَقَهُنَّ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَعَلِيمُ الَّذِي جَعَلَ لَكُمُ الْأَرْضَ مَهْدَى وَجَعَلَ لَكُمْ فِيهَا سُبُلًا لَعَلَّكُمْ تَهْتَتُونَ وَالَّذِي نَزَّلَ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً بِقَرْرٍ فَأَنْشَرْنَا بِهِ بَلْدَةً بَيْتَ so, this is now um, from 8 to 11. And again, it's a common theme where Allah immediately calls their point to the irrationality of disbelief. Um, The fact, but the, the fact that this earth uh, 
can sustain human life as human life is. I mean, jinn don't need gravity to exist, but all that lives on earth other than jinn, uh, not all jinn live on earth, but other than jinn, all that lives on earth relies on gravity. Um, the, the fact that this earth was made fit for human life and the life of other creatures, um, earthly creature, is a miracle in itself. And the irrationality of the belief is to think that this was just a coincidence or an accident, um, and so on. And we say, وَالَّذِي نَزَّلَ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَانْ بِقَدَرٍ that even the fact that the, the cycle of water that comes down in such measured ways to sustain life um, is a miracle. Because, you know, a little variation on the equations that sustain life and it would be unsustainable. Okay. Then we get to 12. والذي خلق الأزواج كلها وجعل لكم من الفلك والأنعام ما تركبون. Um, the only thing, the, among in the traditional tafsir, and this you find in the Sufi esque literature, uh, we've encountered the theme of azwaj, of pairs, in other sources already. And that, and we've said before that when the Quran talks of creating things in pairs. The Quran is not talking about male and female only. Um, but everything, the duality that marks so much of life, even like positive and negative, or something above and something below, or um, right, left, um, or even the passage of time, when we talk about the past and the future, uh, that this duality marks the logic of so much of the life we understand. But Sufi asked the Fasir often when it comes to the duality, and, and I forgot to, to mention this before, that the only absolute singularity is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that in order to reflect on why the Quran often points your attention, like in Surah Al-Rahman, in Surah Al-Dukhan, in, uh, in, in here in um, Zuhruf, to this issue of duality, is to tell you that everything that is a muhdas. Muhdas means everything that needs a causal factor to exist. Everything that does not exist unless there is a causation for it. Um, uh, lives within the laws of duality. When it comes to the one and only, the absolute, the laws of causation and the laws of nature and the laws of science no longer apply. In the language of theology, they say Allah is munazdahun ani dud wa nid wal muqabil wal muadid. This is the type of language that you. If you read a lot of theology, which basically means that if you, when you, when you are internalizing wahdaniya, you're internalizing the oneness of God. That when it comes to God, it's not just yeah we say there are no equals, but there is no opposites either. There is no counters. The entire logic of time and space 
cannot be utilized to understand God. والمقابل والمعادد and there are no parallels to God. The, the, you, there is no frame of reference within the laws of nature by which we can analyze the oneness of God. The reference in 12 and 13 that when you ride your animals, you, you, وتقول سبحان الذي سخر لنا هذا وما كنا له مقرين. Um, this is 13. Um, so that when you ride, ride the, the mount your, your animals, uh, that you say, glory be to God who made this subservient unto us, though we are not equal to it. Um, this is a, a dua that because of a fatwa uh, of several shiyukh back in the early 1900s, well, I mean, 1930s, it was 1930s, 1940s, um, when cars were first invented, there was a question that was sent to Azhar that was sent to Rashid Rida. Um, okay, we know from the Quran that when we ride, when we rode our horses, rode our camels, rode our donkeys, we say, Subhanallah, Sakharana, Lana Hadha, Makuna Lahu Mukranin. Praise be to God who facilitated this to us the donkey, the, the horse, and so on. Wamakuna Lahu Mukranin means that. We uh, equal to it. The it refers to um, this is a blessing that we would not have been uh, entitled to if Allah wouldn't have facilitated to us. That's what what ma kunna law mukrinin means. Um, so the question was, okay, well, now cars are not built by, uh, cars are built by human beings, do we still say that dua? Now, the, if you notice in the, in the verse, it refers to riding ships on, on, on water. Well, but if you ride a ship on water, you don't say, subhanAllah, uh, you say subhanallah bismillahi majraha wa marsaha or wa mursaha or depending on the qira'ah meaning um, in the name of God in the name of God the most merciful may it majraha um, wa uh, may it um May it traverse upon the seas. May may it continue on sailing. So, now, why the different dua with ships is because ships are built by human beings while donkeys, horses, and camels, and the fact that they're willing to eventually let you mount them is something that Allah encodes in them. And... Um, interestingly enough, the most shiuch at the time said that no, when the ships, the cars are like ships, so you should say Bismillahi Majraha Marsaha and not Subhanallah Makun Allah Mukrini. So they, they drew the qiyas, the parallel to ships, not to donkeys. And, but interestingly, by the 50s and 60s, um, Especially uh, the, now the emerging Saudi uh, shiuch were coming onto the, the um, on the scene, and Saudi shiuch said, "No, you you say, Subhanallah, um, because although the cars and airplanes, but it's still God who facilitated the cars and airplanes, um, and it doesn't matter if they're human made, because." There's still, it's God made human beings build them. 
And that's why most of you, if you do a dua when you ride your car or get on the plane, you say, Subhanallah, um, thanks to Saudi sheikhs in the 50s and 60s. <laughs> Uh, you know, just if you, you know, since scholars spent a lot of time studying things, uh, so there. Uh, if you want the, to use the qiyas to a ship, use the qiyas to a ship, which is, you know. Um, but there is a more serious point about this. Um, and, you know, I've often uh, reflected on, on, um, this relationship to things, right? It, 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 we sanitize, we urbanized people, cosmopolitans, if you will. Our relationship to the divine is severely sanitized because if, even, even at the time I was growing up and, you know, uh, was the, If, you know, if you lived in, in a village somewhere and the, the, um, the tributary that supplies your village with water dries up, then what do you do? There's no water from the tributary that supplies your village. You pray to Allah for rain. You sit there and you pray to Allah for rain. And then if rain falls, you fill up the tents, and this is the water you're going to be using. And it is also the water that's going to make the tributary run again. If most of the illnesses that most of the times when you know people got sick, doctors were rather a rarity. I mean, it's not, you can't just always take your kids to doctors. And so every time someone got sick, it was heavy. You, you're constantly communicating with God about so many things, including, and I'm talking about, you know, the, the village in Egypt. Um, you know, if, you're, if your donkey doesn't feel well and refuses to move that day, you're doing dua because you can't afford to buy another donkey. And you also love your donkey. I mean, you develop a relationship with your donkey, right? If someday you're, something happens to your chickens and they all catch something and die, that's another dua. So life presented you with so many things that you're constantly thinking, you know, uh, something, I remember uh, very young, you know, something appeared on my skin that was sort of a weird rash. And um, a dermatologist meant a trip to Cairo, which was a long trip, a far away. So, you know, it was, everyone was doing dua about this thing that appeared, my, you know, and because no one saw it before. It was weird. What is this? And, you know, was I bit by something? Was, But our lives, the system of systematization, and you know, running water, electricity, the the way that we structure life, where you know you need something exceptional to start thinking about God help. Um, you need to be fired from your work or laid off. Uh, you need to have a family member who has a serious emergency. Not even. In, you know, just someone getting the flu and have developing a fever, you, normally we don't panic and do severe, extensive dua about this. We don't, you know, it's like, oh, just go to the doctor and be fine. Um, and I, you know, our lives don't lend themselves to, um, to that, cause, that causal connection with the divine. Something to keep in mind, something to reflect on, uh, because and we all know that what we've built is very frail, right? We all know that, you know, all it would take is for the electricity to be cut off for a few hours or, you know, and we're in serious trouble. But it's very hard to remember 
when these exigencies, these, these emergencies, are not occurring on a daily or semi-daily basis, as in pre-modern life. OK. Uh, uh, an another trivia footnote. Um, the big coup was when um, the Saudi scholars decided that before Saudi airplanes take, take off and Saudi airlines, the dua that is going to be broadcasted from the cockpit will be subhanallah So, and that was the official stem. So now it was the, you know, so. Um, okay. So then, وَإِنَّ إِلَىٰ رَبِّنَا لَمُنْقَلْمُونَ وَجَعَلُوا لَهُ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ جُزْءًا إِنَّ الْإِنْسَانَ لَكَفُورٌ مُبِينٌ أَمْ اتَّخَذَ مِمَّا يَخْلُقُ بَنَاتٍ وَأَصْفَاكُمْ بِالْبَنِينَ وَإِذَا بُشِّرَ أَحْدُهُمْ بِمَا ضَرَبَ لِلرَّحْمَانِ مَثَلًا ضَلَّ وَجْهُهُ مُسْوَدًّا وَهُوَ كَظِيمٌ أَوْ مَنْ يُنَشَّعُ فِي الْحِلْيَةِ وَهُوَ فِي الْخِصَامِ غَيْرُ مُبِينٌ Okay, so this is up to verse 18. And first, وَجَعَلُوا لِلرَّحْمَانِ جُزْءًا That they've, basically that they've made to the Rahman, to Allah, um, Juz is something taken from something. It's referring to offspring contextually. But literally, it is any, any conception of God as having something derived from that God that is equally divine. So then it applies to... Um, most conception or on all conceptions of Trinitarian conceptions in Christianity, which we see later, the Surah makes a reference to all the different tr Trinitarian outlooks out there, uh, as well as the mythology of Arabs at the time, that there are either the the um, angels or God's daughters or that um, typical of the ancient world that um, kings are somehow take part of God's divinity um, and are then divine in, in the godly sense. Uh, so the expression Juz'an here is, is wonderfully perfect because it even challenges and negates the claim of kings and, and chieftains of being divine and godly, like the Pharaoh, as we find in Surah to Zukhruf later. Okay. Um, and, of course, the point that it's making up to verse 18 is that these people did not like having daughters and thought of having daughters as something unwelcome and inferior to having boys or having males. But yet, they claimed that God only has daughters and that all the angels are feminine and they're all God's daughters. And, of course, the, the, the point that it is, by what logic would you be so unhappy about having females as offspring, uh, but yet you say that that's what God has. Now, if pay attention though to um, 18, verse 18. Awaman yunashya'u fil hilya wa huwa fil khisami 
غَيْرُ مُبِينَ This verse, uh, although modern Muslims uh, don't, don't use it often, um, and Islamophobes have not discovered it yet, and I'm sure they, maybe after this haqqa they will, uh, this verse gave rise to a lot of very patriarchal and misogynistic interpretations. Because s many pa patriarchal interpretations understood it as saying, as referring to females and saying, do you attribute to God the gender or the sex that is raised, yunasha of al means that is raised with ornaments and um, that, that basically cares about ornaments, about makeup and looking good. And that is intellectually inferior. So a lot of the male interpreters of the Quran understood it as saying that, that saying, well, you know, women are inferior to men because they care about their looks and ornaments and they're not intellectually, um, they're, they're not, they're, they're not, um, intellectually developed. Now, of course, the reason I say it's a patriarchal interpretation because that's not necessarily at all what it's saying. And in fact, it's, it's not uh, what a lot of the traditional interpretations ignored are reports that this verse doesn't refer to women at all. With two things. One, it could be understood, if it's referring to women, it could be understood that you Arabs, or you, the society that doesn't like women, you do two things. You raise these girls with a hyper focus on their looks. So you're the one who are doing the injustice. And you don't allow them their test, you don't accept their testimony, which was the, the old pre-Islamic law, female testimony was not accepted. And you don't allow them to argue their case in any public forum, because they were not allowed to appear in um, the Council of Mecca. They were not allowed to have uh, even if they had a, a case before a judge, uh, they were not allowed to argue their own cases. So that's one possibility. But the reports that I'm talking about that were ignored is that it is not talking about women, it's talking about idols. Arabs had, like a lot of ancient cultures, had a, a, a long established tradition of ornamenting and decorating their idols. The idols were often female, not male. And they would put gold on them and put, um, you know, expensive jewelry on their idols. And of course, the idols were silent. They don't speak for Khisamigaru meaning that they are silent. Um, they, they have no intellect. Um, is it referring to idols or is it referring to women in the, in the sense that I explained that um, if you go by historical record, I think it's referring to idols. If you're going by, by quality of reports, if you, take, if you ignore the patriarchal because the, the tendency of male interpreters to jump on anything that seems to demean women, which of course is what happened. Uh, and you just go on strengths of transmission, then say it's referring to idols. 
if my understanding of Surah Al-Zukhruf is correct, as we'll talk about the second interpretation, that you put the way you, the, the, the problem is the way you treat women would make more sense. But wait until you, we get to my part, my interpretation. So for that point to make sense. Okay. Um, so 19 is the reference to وَجَعَلُ الْمَلَائِكَةَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ عِبَادُ الرَّحْمَنِ إِنَاثَ That this is the reference to their claim that the angels are the daughters of Allah. Um, okay. 20. وَقَالُوا لَوْ شَاءَ الرَّحْمَنُ مَا عَبَدْنَاهُمْ مَا لَهُمْ بِذَلِكَ مِنْ عِلْمٍ إِنْهُمْ إِلَّا يَخْرَصُونَ um, This, two, two things, is that the Meccans, part of what the, the response to the Prophet in, in arguing with the Prophet, and Surah Al-Zukhruf, um, refers to several arguments that the, that the Meccans made in response to the Prophet. And inshallah, when we, when we talk about my approach to Surah Al-Zukhruf, we'll see why this point is actually really critical. Um, this argument, argumentation point. But part of the arguments is that they simply responded to the Prophet, well, listen, we worship, yes, some of us, not, not all, and especially not Quraysh, but some of us worship the angels as representatives of God, as daughters of God, and thus representing God. But if God would have willed, we would have never developed that practice in the first place. And the response of the Quran, what does it say in response? مَا لَهُمْ بِذَلِكَ مِنْ عِلْمٍ they don't know that. Now, this became, this, this verse, number 20, became co-opted and center place in the debates about predestination, free will, among the theological schools from their I mean, from the time, especially the time that the Prophet ﷺ dies, onwards. When it says they don't know that, is it, as the Mu'tazara said, that God never wills an evil deed. And an evil deed, when it occurs, it doesn't occur because of God's will. Or as it the you know whether the Ishariya elk or the Mataridiya elk that it is somewhere between predestination and free will that perhaps God creates several variant destinies and it's as human beings who pick among these variants and and among these variant destinies, some of them are not good. So, you know, God will create a variant. One destiny is you will not worship. Of course, I'm simplifying. You will not worship um, angels. Another variant, you will worship aliens. But it depends on your choice. You make the choice. That's sort of the Mataridi and some of the Ash'ari uh, approach. Uh, or is it a you know somewhere in between on the spectrum from absolute free will to absolute predestination? It's hard to to um, to express the extent to which that verse became sort of constantly cited and argued about and debated and so on. Um, Of course, and, and 
why does God just say, well, they don't know that, but God doesn't really say, um, how so? I mean, it implies that they're wrong. That's the clear implication, is that they're wrong, or that that argument is invalid, that, well, if God wanted, I wouldn't have done this. Um, and this is, of course, repeated several times in the Quran. But the Mu'tazala argued that the Quran clearly endorsed free will. If you take all what the Quran says about destiny, well, of course, the Ash'ariya argued that no, the issue is um, more hinged than that. And in my opinion, the Matarides tend towards more free will than, than, um, than otherwise. Okay. أَمْ أَتَيْنَوْهُمْ كِتَابًا مِنْ قَبْلِهِ فَهُمْ مُسْتَمْسِكُونَ بِهِ مُسْتَمْسِكُونَ This is what we've encountered before the, 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 the shift in paradigm to text as a frame of reference which, as I mentioned before, struck, it was odd to Arabs. What do you mean we can't make the argument because we don't have a book? It sounded weird to them. And they said it was weird. But um, in my opinion, it's clear that the Quran was making a paradigm shift towards a new civilizational paradigm. Okay. بَلْ قَالُوا إِنَّا وَجَدْنَا آبَاءَنَا عَلَىٰ أُمَّةٍ وَإِنَّا عَلَىٰ أَثَرِهِمْ مُهْتَدُونَ وَكَذَلِكَ مَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ فِي قَرْيَةٍ مِنْ نَذِيرٍ إِلَّا قَالَ مُتْرَفُوهَا إِنَّا وَجَدْنَا آبَاءَنَا عَلَىٰ أُمَّةٍ وَإِنَّا عَلَىٰ أَثَرِهِمْ مُقْرَدُونَ Okay. So this is now... Um, 22 and 23. We, we should actually uh, take on 24 as well. Uh, so, what, what they're saying is that we found our forefathers ala ummati means they are following a custom a tradition a practice they have a way of life and we are sticking to that way of life and then of course the response to that that the Quran offers is how could it be that your rational is that simply we're doing what your, our parents are doing um, don't you have you don't you have a an intellect to decide whether what your parents are doing is wrong or right this these verses became center point in the whole debate about taqlid and ittiba' in the Islamic tradition. Um, and as we will see later, it, it, it is not an accident that it occurs around Surah Al-Zukhruf, again, because of the role of Surah Al-Zukhruf. So Irazi, for instance, says that those who embraced taqlid for imitation as a valid and sufficient grounds for doing what you are doing. And they're talking here, the debate in Islam is not about the taqlid of the um, kuffar, but the taqlid of Muslims to other Muslims. Uh, imitate Muslims imitating Muslims, especially in matters of law. Uh, Arazi says that these verses alone are sufficient to 
um, to rebut the validity of taqlid. Um, someone like Ibn Khawaz, Ibn Khawaz Mindad, sometimes referred to as Ibn Mindad, or erroneously referred to as Ibn Mindad, uh, who is a Maliki scholar, said, no, there is a difference between taqlid and ittiba. Um, taqlid is not valid in Islam, but ittiba is valid in Islam. Ittiba is to follow the opinion, to defer to the opinion of another. But, to still, as a principle, de de demand that the opinion of the other that you defer to be based on khushah, be based on evidence. That's it, Tiba. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Just so, because Surah Al-Zukhruf is, as you will see, it's, it's very important, and it's very important that we understand what's going on with the surah um, in all its nuances. And it's a surah that um, clearly has layers of meaning and um, levels of understanding. Okay, so we were getting, we, we got to the point to, um, this is around verse uh, up to verse 24 <laughs> the, that are saying that these verses become center place in the debate about um, taqlid and ittiba and the, the difference, at least in, as suggested by uh, Ibn Khawaz, and, and it became later on, it became a fairly established point that taqlid huwa ittiba' bila khushah, that you, you imitate someone without valid um, shara'i evidence. Ittiba is you imitate with valid shari evidence. And the difference is, is that ittiba, when you follow someone, is that you are deferring to that person based on rational criteria, meaning that this person is a scholar or it, it, it but you are reserving the right as a term to your deference that this individual is reserving the right to demand the hujah, to demand the evidence. So you're as if you're saying, okay, I'm following you and I might not be demanding the evidence on every point or all the times, but there is an implied covenant of trust between us that whatever I you are telling me is God's law and I'm following, that you have the evidence, and if I demand the evidence, you will present it to me. While taqlid, um, typically when, especially in, in, in pre-modern times, when Muslim jurists attack taqlid and criticize taqlid, what they were most concerned about was the tendency in the Islamic civilization um, for various Muslims to de develop customs and traditions, sometimes cust customs and traditions from localized practices that centered around a sage that claimed to be divinely inspired. Um, so I mean, uh, in, in the example that is often given in books of um, usul, um, is a sage that claims 
as apparently there were several sages in different parts of the Muslim world that claimed to have been reincarnated several times and to have lived several lives. And, um, and that's usually the example that they give as when you do taqlid that is not acceptable. Uh, is, is that you are following this person who claims reincarnation. Well, what is your evidence that you've been reincarnated and what is your evidence that reincarnation is, is acceptable in, in Islam? Um, uh, others are, of course, you know, idiosyncratic sages that would either allow or not allow certain things. Um, one of the examples that according to the 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 um, uh, fatawa literature uh, a sage from java the island of java um, had abolished the limitation on four wives and and again that's usually said you know if if you follow that sheikh that's taqlid and muharram okay Then Surah Al-Zukhruf moves on to the Prophet Ibrahim salam, and the significance of moving on to the Prophet Ibrahim is that the Prophet Ibrahim in encountering his folks rebels against the taqlid of his, his father was reported to have been uh, among the leadership of the, the tribe and to have been a wise man. But the entire society was organized around customs and traditions that are followed. And at least before Ibrahim becomes a prophet, and Ibrahim, like the prophet Muhammad, like the uh, like Moses becomes a prophet at a certain point in his life, m midlife, um, that but his arguments with his people about the irrationality of their customs and their habits starts out before he is a prophet, and so. Surah Al-Zukhruf, moving on to, to the issue of Ibrahim, fits with that theme of that following traditions and customs without evidence is invalid. Okay. This takes us to verse 29. بَلْ مَتَّعْتُ هَؤُلَاءِ بل متعت هؤلاء وآباهم حتى جاءهم الحق ورسول مبين ولما جاءهم الحق قالوا هذا سحر وإن به كافرون that in twenty oh before that sorry in twenty eight let's go back to twenty eight وَجَعَلَهَا كَلِمَةً بَاقِيَةً فِي عَقْبِهِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْجِعُونَ The significance of 28 is that it starts out with Ibrahim who challenges his people <laughs> on the basis of that their traditions don't make sense. Then Ibrahim becomes a prophet. And Allah then comments that means that God made the prophecy, the message of monotheism in the lineage of Ibrahim. Now, there is a, a debate in Islamic theology whether God did so because, uh, because of the initial act, the moral act, of Ibrahim challenging the customs of his people as a matter of principle. And by that, he earned the prophecy and earned the blessed lineage. 
or whether the, the this is just the issue of the blessed lineage of Ibrahim is something that is in the province of the divine and you know why Allah cho- chose the lineage of Ibrahim uh, it's a debate that, I mean it's interesting to because it goes back again to the to the balance between the role of ethics rationality um, and the interventions of divine sovereignty in that role but Um, the other thing is that وَجْعَنَا fi aqabi. remember the, the khutbah in which I was talking about the Isra and the Maraj and the role of Jerusalem and Ibrahim's monotheism and the, the Islamic uh Islamic theology that in Islam monotheism, the true monotheism is all preserved only in Islam, is center point to this. That it is in the lineage of Ibrahim that monotheism continues to be protected. And the reason for that This is, uh, I was visited by uh, Henry. Um, I don't, I don't know, he, I think he thinks I have chicken because a lot of times I feed him chicken. Um, although I'm sure he doesn't smell it. You know, but anyway. Um, the, um, uh, Henry, uh, 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 now I'm thinking of Henry rather than, okay, so, uh, okay. Monotheism, and this is a, a um, I wish modern Muslims would, would read more history and understand this. Monotheism had a very difficult time historically remaining pure. It is, it is a well-established historical fact that the Israelites, in the history of the Israelites, the Israelites worshipped many idols. Um, and I'm not talking about Islamic history. I'm talking about scholarship in academic quarters. If you if you pick up any book about the history of Jews, uh, uh, monotheism was the exception. It wasn't the rule. And time and time again, the Israelites would go back and into idol worship. And of course, we know with Christianity, idolatry became incorporated in the idea of the Trinity, and it was. Which is just another form of um, the mythology of um, the age of idolatry, and it's really only in Islam that we have pure monotheism being protected. So when the Quran says, "Baqiyatan fi aqibihi laadnahum yarjoon," so that they may return, return to what that. Time and time again, monotheism is going to go astray. Allah will send another prophet to remind people of monotheism, and time and time again, they will go astray. So that they may keep coming back to monotheism every time they go astray. So it's one of these wonderfully compact expressions of the Quran that when in light of considerable scholarship, you say, wow, that, that's actually quite profound. Okay. And بَلْ مَتَّعْتُ هَا أُولَيَّ وَآبَاءَهُمْ that despite 
the corruption, despite the fact that they would keep going back to idolatry, Allah continued showering generations of people with blessings until the Prophet Muhammad And then, as with other prophets that would come remind them of monotheism, the go-to claim is the go-to claim is whether you have a miracle performer like Jesus or Moses or a prophet like Muhammad who is revealing the Quran to them whatever comes from these prophets, the go-to claim is that this is sorcery. Now, a side note, in our modern age, we don't say sorcery because sorcery doesn't play, have the social and cultural role that it used to have in um pre-modern age, where sorcery just was very much a part of life, as was uh, horoscopes and all, all of these things. Um, but what is the equivalent of the claim of saying it's sorcery to anyone that comes and says, challenges us with an un uncomfortable truth, and especially someone who's challenging our established habits and customs? Um, what comes to mind, I mean, the most current one is fake news or trickery or, oh, this is just a personality cult. All the things by which we don't respond to the actual arguments, but we attack the either the person who's delivering an ad hominem attack or we say that um that there is without dealing with evidence that there is a deception and it's it's remarkably similar to to the claim that this is sorcery okay then قالوا لولا نزل هذا القرآن على رجل من القر من القريتين عظيم. They the part of the constant criticisms of the Meccans is that why if if there's going to be a prophet sent to us, a قريتين the two villages that it alludes to are مكة and الطائف. So why wasn't it sent to um, uh, uh, sorry, not a Taif, Thaqif, Mecca and Thaqif. Why wasn't it sent to someone who is richer, someone who's more powerful? Um, like al Walid ibn Mughira or Urwa ibn Mas'ud um, and there, there were several others of these um, wealthy, prominent individuals. In my approach to to Zulat al sukhruf this ayah becomes far more significant uh, than maybe in the traditional approaches, and we'll get to it, inshallah. Um, the response of the, of the of the Quran to this is you think you control who Allah chooses from what role and we'll come back to this verse in the second approach inshallah because of its importance note um نحن قصمنا بينهم معيشتهم في الحياة الدنيا ورفعنا بعضهم فوق بعض. This is verse uh, 
ورفعنا بعضهم فوق بعض درجات ليتخذ بعضهم بعضهم بعضا سخرية ورحمة ربك خير مما يجمعون Allah distributed shares among human beings. Yattakhidu ba'dum ba'dan sukhriya means so that they will rely and use one another. So it's that theme of diversity that the purpose of diversity is to create interdependence among human beings. Different talents, different skills, different abilities, um, different shares of wealth, different, so that there will be an interdependence. Um, but ultimately, if you want the ultimate good, it's Allah's blessings. That it's better than all of it. This ayah, which has always been understood in that in the traditional approach, Sufi esque or not or otherwise or tra or classical traditional nakli, um, has always been understood that way. That it is it basically is saying interdependence and diversity is part of God's plan. In modern Islam, I was shocked when I heard in khutbah someone citing this verse for a very different purpose. And he was saying that God says God distributed wealth among human beings and it is part of the divine plan that some people dominate other people. So he understands sukhriya not as use and rely on, but to mean sakhara shay, to dominate it. And that you have to accept your state in, in life and accept that you know those who are those who are in power and those who are rulers and those who are leaders and that's what Allah has that's their station in life and you have to accept your place and that ultimately just stay focused on the big price in the hereafter because rahmatu rabbi khairun min ma yajma'un that Allah's blessings is best of them. that to see it is clearly a modern innovation and it relies on the fact that modern Arabs are not familiar with a term like sukhriya. Because a modern Arab, the way they would hear sukhriya, they would in fact think it means to dominate. While in classical Arabic, sukhriya means to rely on, to use one another. Um, but of course, you know, that tafsir was from uh, an one of the Islamic centers here in the United States that was preaching what has now become, uh, you know, classical Jami and Madkhali Islam that, uh, and, you know, the type of Islam you get from places like Zaytuna, um, that, you know, you just have to accept class privilege, racial privilege, um, all types of privilege and uh, accept injustice and legitimate it as God's will, which it is, if that becomes the Islam of the future, I predict Islam will die. It, there's no way Islam will survive as a religion. Uh, so, I mean, I be don't believe that that's what Allah wants for Islam. And so I can't believe that, I will not believe that this will become the, 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 the uncontested of Islam of the future. But that type of Islam, uh, the Amalites try to, to establish it and to, to um, make it universal uh, at different points. The Abbasids tried as well, and, and, and it never survived. It, it never worked. 
because it, there, there, there is something in the spirit of the Quran that constantly resists that type of legitimation of despotism and injustice uh, and oppression. Okay. Okay. Then we go to 23, um, oh, 33, sorry, and, um, and notice here that وَلَوْلَا أَنْ يَكُونَ النَّاسُ أُمَّةً وَاحِدَةً لَجَعَنَّا لِمَنْ يَكْفُرُ بِالرَّحْمَانِ لِبُيُوتِهِمْ سُقُفَا مِنْ فِضَّةٍ وَمَعَارِجٍ عَلَيْهَا يَظْهَرُونَ So, the, the, how, let's look at the study Quran for a second. So, study Quran. And were it not that mankind be, be, would be one community, we would have made for those who disbelieve in the compassionate silver roofs for their, for their houses, stairways whereon to ascend. Um, the translation, I don't think from the translation you, you, you get the point of the verse at all. What the verse is saying is, if Allah, if Allah treated people on earth according to the worth of life on earth to Allah Allah would have no problem with giving all the wealth that human beings desire to those who don't believe in God so if you don't believe in God God would be if 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 uh, God would give you roofs of fudda of silver Wa ma'arij means and um, uh, wait, um, uh, roofs of silver and stairways of silver within your homes. That is, you know, an absolute sign of luxury. But if that would happen, if Allah dealt with disbelievers, according to what the earth, life on earth is worth in Allah's eyes, Allah would do so. Would say, go ahead, have roofs of silver and stairways of silver. But if Allah would do that, then all people on earth would become disbelievers. Because everyone would see the amount of privilege that disbelievers are achieving and say, we want it. So they would become Ummah Wahida Fil Kuf, a single nation, a single community in disbelief. The grammar is unusual, and that's why uh, a literal interpretation or literal translation wouldn't work. Okay. And. They, they would have very, you know, luxury homes with luxury doors and luxury beds. وَزُخْرُفًا وَإِنَّ كُلُّ ذَلِكَ لَمَّا مَتَاعُ الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةُ عِنْدَ رَبِّكَ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ That Allah would not just give them uh, silver roofs and silver stairs and lush beds and lush doors, Allah would give, give them highly decorated homes. Decorated homes was always, until, you know, we have the Industrial Revolution, decorated homes was a sign of wealth. Remember that decor, decorated homes was done through um, a great deal of artistry. Uh, what do you call these people, the, the ones who... Artisans. Artisans. Artisans? Maybe masons? Uh, yeah, masons. Like, you know, special masons. Um, and, and, you know, they, they, but if you would decorate your home with anything, calligraphy or little statues or whatever, it, it was a sign of wealth. Um, 
So we get from this two things, is that And this is not this is not my point. This is again from traditional tefasir. That we get two things. That one that wealth is not a it, it, wealth is not any indication of someone's place with Allah. But second is that in point a question that was asked. I think it was last halakha. Um, about the the blessings that human beings can enjoy while being completely rebellious. So, in other words, what the what does it mean that, that the fact that people can continue enjoying great blessings, although on the life on this earth, although they are um, completely on the wrong path. It, Life on earth is not the center life that from from the divine perspective. Okay. We'll come back to, to this verse in inshallah in the other approach. Now here we come to the real point though. Is that Yeah, if Allah would have given human beings their, according to their wishes, Allah would have no problem giving all the wealth to, to people, um, to, the, to the kuffar of Mecca, as well as to anyone who doesn't believe in God. And then, however, then that would make so many people go astray because they are not seeing a complicated example of the distribution of wealth. But the key thing for human beings is, is that we can put it this way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, um, um, I'm, I'm trying to, to remember how it's phrased. Did I write it somewhere? No. Anyway, Allah uh, Ana Jalisu Man Zakarani. I am with whoever is in remembrance of Allah. So what if you are not in remembrance of Allah? What if, if you're in remembrance of Allah, the space is filled with divinity? I am present with whoever remembers me. So what if you are not in remembrance of Allah? This area as was pointed, tells you of a scary rea reality. <clears throat> that if that space is not filled with divinity, it will be filled with darkness. If you don't fill that space with the remembrance of Allah, what will fill it is the demonic. Now, Traditional tafsir typically say that نُقَيِّدُ اللَّهُ shaytana means that you have a Qareen who is a jinn who is evil. And that Qareen will more firmly attach to you and more firmly influence you the less you remember Allah and find it harder to attach to you and far harder to influence you the more you remember Allah. 
in Sufi Astafasir, they agree with that, but they add the following, which is a statement that I like, and I hope I wrote it down somewhere. Um, Uh, I didn't write it, but what they say is that keep in mind that the scariest demon that could accompany you is not your jinn karin, but it's yourself. That if you allow yourself to become demonic, to slip into becoming a in shaitan insi, human shaitan, um, your, your, your Korean, your jinn Korean is the least of your problems. Um, I tend to take the issue of Korean shaitan as a Korean literally. Um, I think I've said that before. And maybe that's just because of my, the experiences I've had in life. Um, I've had experiences where I, I've seen something that attaches to people that is demonic. Um, And that has had a very huge impact on... Uh, but again, remember that all the demonic is very weak before Allah. And if you remember Allah and you resort to Allah, the demonic has no influence upon you. I mean, so there is no reason to feel... Um, several, a, a couple of other things. Um, there is a hadith that says um, I'm going to paraphrase it because I, I, I didn't write it down. Is a ahab Allahu ahadakum. That that if Allah loves someone, Allah protects that person from the temptations of dunya. كما يحمي كما يحمي سقيمة الماء that like someone guards the source of life the, as, as water, as a source of life, um, that if you become closer to Allah and Allah, you have that nearness, Allah protects you from the temptations of life on earth, not necessarily by making you poor, although often it does mean that, but by preventing you from the types of things that make you attached to life on this earth. Uh, frequent tests, poor health. Remember that the Prophet ﷺ, think of how many children died. Um, how many of the prophets uh, so, so, the children died and how many of us would would be able to bear that um, I mean if we take that as a yardstick it, one of the the narratives and I think I mentioned this in a, in a, in a Juma sometime maybe a year ago or something uh, where Ibn Mas'ud 
And I mean, it's just always it's just one of these narratives about the seerah of the Prophet that just sticks you, it sticks with you, especially when you um, think of this whole notion of dhikr and Allah giving people ceilings of silver and stairways of silver if and and you know those who who say we don't care about god and we just want the wealth allah will give them that i mean i i've seen homes that might as well would have been made of silver they're they're um um but anyway uh when ibn masoud sees the Prophet uh, sleeping on, on the floor and then he wakes up and the floor has left creases in his face and he tells the Prophet um, you, you know why don't you let me just lay out a mat to sleep on the floor and when the, the response of the Prophet just is it can, it has to stay with you Mali wa mal hazi dunya. Mali wa mal hazi dunya. You mean, don't tempt me. Don't mat on the floor. Don't tempt me. Um, um, and in some versions of that report, he says, you know, I, I, my relation to this dunya is just like a traveler who stops at a water hole drinks from it and keeps going on um i mean i i mentioned this because we we so many muslims love to go to shiuch that talk to them about the sunnah of the prophet and imitating the sunnah of the prophet and i'm always struck that with all the tahmids and the tasbihs and the takbirs and all the pietistic affectations and then what you get from them is wear hijab, wear a turban, wear a beard, I don't know, you know, right foot, left foot, as I, as I, yeah. As you know what I said on one of my khutbos. Um But the sunnah of the Prophet is this. I mean, and that's much, um, I wonder how popular those shiuch will be if they say, you, you know, you want the sunnah, um, go home, give all your money to poor people, and sleep on a mat on the floor. Um, I would like to see their Facebook um, follows after that. <laughs> well, f Facebook and other stuff, uh, Instagram, I know Facebook and Instagram. I live in the modern world. Uh, okay. You know, there, there. Um, th this is uh, a lesson that stayed with me. I. This is in the, the young my my younger years, and um, I was asking Sheikh Ghazali. I said I I had met someone and I was saying you know the, the uh, this this um, fellow who was giving halakhas and he said that that the halakhas were that he's seen. Um, uh, that he's seen Jamalullah, he's seen Allah's beauty. And he was going to give halakhas to describe Allah's beauty. And I was saying, you know, shall I attend these halakhas? And he, Sheikh Ghazali didn't like, I mean, our questions were annoying, and he didn't like questions. And, you know, so he often just. And he he um, quoted something to me that later on I just I, I learned came from a tafsir, which meant something like, um, "Have you examined 
تأدبه تأدب الشيخ بالجلال. Have you examined the extent to which the ethics and the morality of that sheikh reflect his understanding of divinity? And of course, I had just heard the sheikh, uh, uh, met, just met him once. And, you know, so I, I said that. And Sheikh Ghazali said, so there's your answer. And then walked away, I think, pretty disgusted with me. Um, um, but the, the point is that, you know, if, if a teacher doesn't give you the hard stuff, then they're fake. Um, you know, if, if it's all a sanitized, feel-good delivery as to things that you can do cosmetically and optically and provide you with a, with a little pep, you know, pep up your life. They're fake. Um, the, the, the Sunnah of the Prophet is a transformative, is an ethical transformation. And it's an ethical transformation that gives humanity a great deal. And it is not about being an egocentric human being if it's an ethical transformation or so-called ethical transformation that is about making you feel good but doesn't benefit anyone else, that's egocentrism. That, that's exactly what narcissism is. Um, it has to give. And if it doesn't give, it's narcissistic. And that's not the sunnah of the Prophet Yeah, Yeah, Yeah. Okay, moving on. What time is it? Uh, I'm starting to get that feeling. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Don't rush. I'm starting to get the feeling that it's going to have to be a two-part halakha. Split it into Sunday, or Tuesday. Sunday. Uh. <laughs> Don't freak out. I misspoke. <laughs> Okay. Uh, okay let, let's just keep going for uh, until we. Uh, ten. What? Ten minutes until Makhrib. Ten. Okay. 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 Uh, of course, you know, note the, the very alarming uh, ayah in um, 28 that... 38. Uh, or 38. Um, that in the hereafter, you come in whatever demonic influence and um, wish they were as far away from you as, as possible. Okay. Okay, I was told not to rush, and I'm trying to resist the temptation to rush. Um, not to rush? Never rush. <laughs> I can't see. I'm not wearing my glasses. <laughs> Um, okay. Oh, oh man. <laughs> okay. So uh, if uh, let's just then go on and uh, uh, so we are now at 41. أَفَأَمْتَ تُصْمِعُ الصُّمَّ أَوْ تَهْدِيَ الْعُمْيَ 
ومن كان في ضلال مبين فإما نزبنا بك فإن منهم منتقمون the only thing I'd say about this is that again which we encountered several times that the Quran consistently reminds the Prophet that there are people that are not accessible um, they're, they're as if they're deaf and blind and the the illusion that if uh, uh, this is on 41 if we treat you like other prophets where we decide that we're going to take you away after they have denied your message we will destroy them this little verse becomes center point again in the debates about predestination in the Islamic tradition. The Mu'tazada argued that this is proof that fate is determined by God, that fate is contingent on human decisions, including whether Allah would destroy Mecca or not destroy Mecca. So according to the Mu'tazila, nothing is determined, including whether Muhammad is going to be taken away, meaning dies, without the Meccans ever converting to Islam, um, and that God's then interacts with human decisions and says, okay, fate is contingent on what people decide. While, of course, the, the Ash'ariya completely rejected the argument and said, no, God is telling them of contingencies that God knew beforehand will not come to be. If you look at the verse, it, it's, it's interesting. I mean, if you read, if you, modern Muslims don't bother reading anything in their tradition. But these debates were very rich and remarkably nuanced and remarkably philosophical. I, I mean, in, um, anyway. إِمَّا نُرِيَنَّكَ الَّذِي وَعَدْنَاهُمْ فَإِنَّ عَلَيْهِمْ مُقْتَضِرُونَ Again, either we will show you some of this or not. And that, again, is part of the debate because that, Contingency. Either we will, or we might not. When you said ten minutes, ten minutes until Maghrib, or ten minutes until Isha. No, no. Oh, okay. So yeah. still us, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um. Okay. Then we get to. Of course, 45 is a rhetorical, uh, a, a rhetorical point. Ask, when you say ask the earlier prophets whether we've sent, whether we've allowed, this again is a reference to the constant corruption of monotheism that with earlier prophets time and time again, although the prophet preached monotheism like Moses, like Isa, the way human beings would interpret the prophecy, the message of the prophet, is to allow idol worship in some form or another. Um, and and this is a, a, a point that the Meccans, part of their arguments with the the Prophet is that they claimed that Ibrahim never forbade the worship of, well, it wasn't the Meccans actually, it was more the, the people of Thaqif who focused on this point. But anyway, the, Ibrahim never forbade the worshiping of angels as God's daughters. Um, and that's mythology. 
I mean, but again, it, that's what this verse is sort of alluding to. Um, okay, then it goes again now to Musa. And why Musa in Surah Zuhruf? In the second approach that I keep alluding to, um, we'll see the answer to that. I'm not the, sure that the traditional approach really has a response as to why Musa in particular in Surah Zuhruf. So the confrontation was for own. And there is a preface to this that M Musa comes to the people of the Pharaoh and there is a series of ayat. And either hum minha yad hakun, that their response to the, to the ayat that Musa brings to the Egyptians, to the people of the Pharaoh, is a consistent mockery. Now, the ayat that it's referring to here are the, the um, what are called the seven plagues of Moses, and that each time the, these people become inflict, inflict, um, afflicted with a plague, they finally go to Musa and say, okay, can you ask your God to lift the plague? And, and, and Musa would say, okay, and God would lift the plague, and when God would lift the plague, they would go back again and defy Musa. And uh, the Pharaoh himself would repeatedly give Musa hope of letting the followers of Musa and the Israelites leave Egypt, but then would renege on his promise time and time again. Um, and the constant excuse is that, well, Moses is probably a sorcerer. So Moses is probably pling, bringing these plagues through sorcery and, and lifting the plagues through sorcery. Until finally, we have the, the sinking of the Pharaoh on, and his army. But what I give, as you've noticed, what I give the khutbah about is the ayahs, about the, the um, uh, when Pharaoh, wanada Fir'aun, wanada Fir'aun fi qawmi, qala ya qawmi, alaysa li mulku musr, wa hazi al-anharu tajri min tahti, afala tubsurun, أم أنا خير من هذا الذي هو مهين ولا يكاد يبين فلولا ألقي عليه إسورة من ذهب أو جاء معه الملائكة مقترنين The Pharaoh says, look, look at the amount of power and wealth that I have. This man is not only poor, but has a serious speech impediment. And the speech impediment reportedly that Moses suffered from is because he burned his tongue when he was young. Um, and the reference to the gold, this is uh, in verse uh, 53. Well, one is the fact that he's not wearing gold means that he's not wealthy, but there is another reference that I didn't talk about in the khutbah, or I didn't mention in the khutbah. The son of wealthy classes in Pharaonic Egypt, or at least during this period especially, but it, it continues on in, in several of the Pharaonic families, um, or most of the Pharaonic families, is that part of your status is to be vested with certain gold ornaments and certain designs that you wear. 
and the gold ornaments that you wear would tell people whether you, you know, you come from a certain nobility, whether you come from a certain region in Egypt, and the status of your wealth, whether you are the son or daughter of uh, uh, um, one of the priests, or you are the son or daughter of the treasurer of, of the pharaoh, or the cook of the pharaoh, or you are related to the pharaoh. So he's saying, look, Moses grew up in my palace. But look at him now. He's wearing rags. And I didn't vest him with anything. So it's like saying, look at this loser who grew up, grew up in my palace and look at him now having no authority whatsoever vested by me as a pharaoh unto him. So it's a classist reference, but it is also a typical bureaucratic prestige reference and um and of course the 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 other thing that is often pointed out in the traditional approaches is that well, I've, I've talked on the khutbah about that human beings and and this is what the quran is alluding to is that human beings um often respond to those who act entitled towards them that human beings often don't have in the same way that they don't have the guts to challenge tradition that doesn't make sense they don't have the guts to challenge privilege that doesn't make sense. And that the way the wealthy and powerful assert power over the disempowered is to simply speak in terms of entitlements. But as what the more they speak in terms of entitlements that as if these entitlements make the perfect sense in other words as if they're ordained somehow the more people are reluctant to challenge entitlements but the quranic comment that in no common in fas common that they were a, a corrupt people meaning that the reason part of the reason that they refuse to think of the irrationality of the privileges that were asserted by Pharaoh the type of absolute power of saying wala urikum illa ma ara uh, you only your opinions should be in according to what I think um, is that they always lived in hope in sharing in the privilege and entitlements that the, that the Pharaoh enjoyed so as I said in the khutbah as the Prophet ﷺ said Kama takunu yuwalla alaykum, is that the less the moral lesson of the prophet is that if you want moral leaders you have to be moral people if you are a people that covet privilege and power and are willing to be hypocritical towards the privileged and power in hopes of sharing in that privilege of power then you'll get you'll be led as you are now there is a subtle uh, point that is often made in sufi-esque tafsir that's actually um worthy of of consideration that ultimately the way the pharaoh is and his armies are punished is that they're drowned 
what the Pharaoh uses to to brag about is his wealth that comes from the rivers of the Nile. Um, that there is um, a tradition that says man ta'azza بشيء من دون الله أهلكه الله به that what you use the sin that you assert or that you rely on to rebel against Allah your destruction will be through that sin now, this is, why is this important? And it, it has to be understood. You get a lot of written about it in Sufi-esque tafsirs, not so much in traditional tafsirs. But that um, if you are a, a, a high and mighty human being, you're under your your uh, um, um, what is the word I'm looking for? The, your um, under no no. What what is the word I'm looking for? What will undermine you? Your your what will undermine you? What will undo you? Uh, undoing. Your 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 undoing. Undoing. What your undoing will be by the sin that is core to who you are. You know, it, 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 this can't be understood, I mean, and in, in, the, in the Sufi esque literature, they, they go into, uh, that, it, it, that it is the, the demonic sin that will feed on you, that will unravel you, that will eat away at you. So if you're a stingy human being, for instance, your stinginess is what will turn your family against you, your loved ones against you, that will make eventually, make your life miserable and your hereafter miserable. If you're an arrogant and proud human being, the loneliness that will be your fate, the isolation, the, 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 the Again, it's the sin of your arrogance coming back to haunt you. And so, but what is interesting is that in the, 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 the Sufi, this is, these are the, 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 old, the medieval Sufis, not the modern day Sufis that, you know, sell themselves to the petrol dollars and uh, whoever can fund their, their schools and, and their mosques and their Cadillac cars and their Mercedes Benz. I mean, a Sufi that sells himself so he can have a Mercedes Benz and a driver. Go figure. I mean, you know, it's like the modern day, modern age just makes you want to shoot yourself. Um, but in the old tradition, in the old tradition, um, not the Sufis of Bin Bayya and the likes, um, that if you are like the people of the Pharaoh and you're sitting there kissing up to the ruler because you are hoping to share in the privileges that this ruler monopolizes, the corruption of the ruler and the poverty that will afflict your society is the sin that you sowed. Now, the reason I posit this is that 
although the, the Sufi literature mentions it sort of in passing, um, but it is a wonderfully... It's a it's a it's a form of of a, a social historical philosophy as to the type of ailments that will haunt nations. You know, it, it people. It's literally people will reap what they sow, sow what they reap, or reap what they sow, reap, reap what, what they, they sow. sow. Right? You you are individually and collectively. And the fact that they say, well, it's it, the, the fact that Allah chose drowning for the Pharaoh is symbolic to communicate a moral lesson as to the nature of sin and nature of punishment. And to understand that even if the punishment doesn't befall you, you are dooming your children or your grandchildren or so in other words it's the 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 bill is going to become due sooner or later man ta'azza bi shay'in min dunillah ahlakahu Allah bih people should remember that think about the sin that is distracting you, distracting you away from Allah. Because I'll tell you, life has taught me that even if your distraction is a marriage or a relationship, that will be your undoing. If it's a job, that will be your undoing. If it's prestige, that will be your undoing. Whatever it is, it will be your undoing. There is, there are a lot of people that they are very good. And I'm learning a little bit. Remember, this surah is a zukhruf, which we'll come to. Zukhruf, right? There are a lot of people that are very good about putting out an appearance. But the hell they live in is because of the sin that they've sowed. And they, 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 they become addicted. They can't extract themselves. But it, it, there is this remarkable synchronicity in this. And I get very scared about the fate of so many Muslim nations. Um, you know, all, all the nations that commit so much haram with, um, because of the discovery of oil and all the cheap wealth that this has created among so many people. When the bill when the bill becomes due, what's going to happen? Okay. Now, what what uh, what number are we on? Oh, of our home, so that's fifty-five. Um. And then Allah moves to Isa ibn Maryam. But note that here, the approach is a bit different. Because what the surah says is that, وَلَمَّا ضُرِبَ إِبْنُ مَرْيَمْ مَثَلًا إِذَا قَوْمُكَ مِنْهُ يَصُدُّونَ That when Allah tells them about Isa ibn Maryam, your people corrupt the, the, the message of Isa ibn Maryam. How so? Um, there, is a, there, there is a narrative of an occasion for revelation um, that 
the Meccans, one, told, responded to the Prophet, والسلام, and because here, um, the, um, what was his name? Did I write it somewhere? Oh, Zabari, Ibn Zabari. Uh, so, first the Meccans told the Prophet, why are you blaming us? The Christians worship Jesus son of, as a son of God. So the fact that some of us worship angels as daughters of God <clears throat> is surely better than a son of God. That's one. But second, Ibn Zabari is so I'm supposed to made um, uh, what we would call, you know, a smart aleck point in response to the prophet that um, Ibn Zabari goes to the to the prophet in front of the Meccans and says, "Doesn't your Quran say that they will be cast, they and the the idols that they worship, they and their gods will be cast in hellfire?" And the, the Prophet ﷺ says, yes, the Qur'an does say that. Of course, not in Surah Al-Zukhruf, but in several other surahs. And he says, well, if that is so, then the Christians worship Isa, and some of Thaqif worship the angels as daughters of God, and some Jews worship the, the, depending on, anyway. So that means that Jesus will be in hellfire, the angels will be in hell, hellfire, according to the Quran. And if that is so, then it's, hellfire can't be such a bad place. And upon hearing that smart Alec remark, the, the Meccans broke out laughing because they thought it's a wonderfully intelligent point. So if you go to um, if you go to um, where is it? Yeah, so it says uh, in 58, وَقَالُوا آلِهَتُنَا خَيْرٌ أَمْ هُوَ مَا ضَرَبُوهُ لَكَ إِلَّا جَدَلًا بَلْ هُمْ قَوْمٌ خَصِمُونَ This is 58. What's referring to is that it's saying the, the point that that it describes them as an argumentative people and that it's not a serious point. It's a point made in argumentation. Of course, the, the response to Ibn Zabari is, is um, it's a common sense point. It, when, it, well, there's also a grammatical point, but there's a common sense point. The, gra the grammatical point is that the actual ayah the, it uses the the harf that it uses refers to not animate objects but inanimate objects that would be thrown in hell with them but that the grammatical point is it has its own problems but the common sense point is obviously the quran was not talking about throwing angels in, in hellfire or throwing jesus in hellfire um but it is an example of the argumentativeness that people can use to m make light of a serious point.
And then Surah Al-Zuhruf moves on from responding to the Meccans by, by simply saying it's, it, they're being argumentative. Qawmun um, To talking about the message of Jesus himself that he was sent as a corrective to the practices and habits of the Israelites at his time. That but after his death, this is 65. That after his death, that it's referring to all the different schools of thought about the doctrine of Trinity. Which by the time of the Prophet, this is post Council of Nasir. And even though it's post Council of Nasir, you could easily count, I don't know, it's, I, I, if you count both the underground or secret um, theologies and above ground, well known, documented, the, the Trinity has caused so much debate and various sects within Christianity that focus on the nature of Jesus, the nature of the Trinity, whether they're co-equal gods, they're, they're gods with three independent wills or a single will, I mean, endless variety as to, um, and that's what فاختلف الأحزاب فيما بينهم فويل للذين ظلموا من عذاب يوم أليم Okay, then we get to 67. Translation. I want to see how the study Quran says. And Akhila, the study Quran just translates it as friends. Friends on that day will be enemies to one another, save for the reverend. Now, the, in traditional tafsir, the, there is nothing special about what they say. Is that, and the hereafter, those people who came used to have close relationships as buddies. Um, very close buddies, they will come in the hereafter and they're in no, no mood for a buddy relationship and they will turn against each other. What's very interesting is not the traditional tefasir, it's the Sufi esque tefasir. Because they pause at this and they say why did the Quran use al akhilla and why al akhilla which means people who are friends but in a close friendship what we what we would say, someone, I treat you like my sister. I treat you like my brother. And they say, well, these people will turn against one another very easily in the hereafter. They won't be able to stand one another. Well, how would a relationship of akhla of this type of closeness be in Islam where you would in fact help one another 
towards grace rather than towards damnation. Al-Ghazali, of course, Muhammad al-Ghazali, who had clear Sufi influences when he wrote Ihya Ulum al-Din, um, says yeah well, uh, uh, he says that that all relationships, if you say to someone that you are like a sister to me or you are like a brother to me, in Ahya Ulum al Din, Hamd al Ghazali says, this is not enforceable in law but it's enforceable in ethics that there is a covenant between you as sacred as the covenant of marriage. The violation of that covenant is an ethical infraction. Where does Ghazali get this and why does, do the Sufis focus on this so much? Well, in part, this is because of a hadith that I haven't heard in the modern age. Um, well, I mean, in the Islamic centers, which, as you know, anyway. Uh, that the, the hadith of the Prophet, alayhi salatu salam, who says, Al-akhawain kamathalu liyadayn yakhsilu ihdahum al-ukhra. That brothers in Islam, or sisters in Islam, are like two hands washing one another. You know, when you wash your hand, you go like this. Yeah. Um, and there's another hadith that says, كمثل البنيان, كمثل البنيان, يشد بعضه بعضه, that it, it's like a single building, one part of it supporting another. So, in the Sufi literature, because, of course, Sufis um, said, and I, I you know, I, I would be cheating you if I jumped, skipped over this and you told me not to rush, so yep. do, don't blame me. Um, so in Sufi Escriature, they say, if you meet another person and the nature of your relationship, either because you said it, you are my brother, you are my sister, or the nature of the relationship should have led to a natural brotherhood or sisterhood, then between you are eight rights. Thaman hukuk. And I think this is from, I, I hope I, I wrote it right. Uh, this is, I think, from Ibn Ajiba, who lists the... I think he's, he's quoting Ghazali. Is he quoting Ghazali? I, I, I was looking last night for someone who had the eight rights. I mean, they're phrased in Ahi Alum al-Din, but Ghazali, but they're, they're the same in a lot of the, the Sufi literature. Um, so I'm going to paraphrase them according to what is the, co the, the co common formulas. They're often listed as eight or seven. Uh, I haven't seen anyone. Some I've listed, some I've listed nine. But, okay. So wait, if if everyone knows this, and I don't need to go through it. No. <laughs> Shh, is Rami everybody? <laughs> oh. Very bold to assume they know all the things. Oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> 
Okay, so the first. I mean, I I think I I do it because it's interesting that how much you can if you if you're dealing with a text, and you're an interpretive t- agent towards this text. The text can yield as little or, or as great as the interpretive as the intellect of the interpretive agent, and the morality of the interpretive agent. I mean, the interpretive agents didn't have to think very heavily about the whole notion of akhla and when do the akhla turn. I mean, I actually, a long time ago, I, I was trying to research in Latin literature for whether anyone in the Latin literature spoke about the rights of brotherhood. And I couldn't find anyone who spoke about that. So it seems like a peculiarly Muslim thing. And it's very fascinating that that civilization even went to... Um, okay, so... So al-Haqq al-Awwal... I mean, I wrote the more... Uh, the Ibn Ajiba uh, copies Ghazali, but I, I wrote the... So al-Haqq al-Awwal al-Mal is the uh, financial relationship. Um, he, he has then, he, he says there's, the, 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 he gets this from Ghazali, that there's three different levels to the relationship of, of financial solidarity. Um, but, and, and their common sense. I mean, it's not their, their, but it's that if you, that it is not okay for, in this type of relationship, like a marriage relationship, or even if you don't say outright marriage, but that for one side of the relationship to be in dire need and the other side not to. Other than the the rights, note a hukuk of pleasantries like buying gifts, in in ayad and in muasan and so on. Um, so that's the first financial relation. The second is a nafs, um, which is normally when they say nafs, it, it's it's what we would call in our modern age um, emotional health, um, spiritual health, that you smile in someone's face, that you ask how they are, that you talk to them about their problems, um, that you worry about whether they're happy or unhappy. Um, that's all al-i'ana bin nafs. Um, that then the, the typically they they argue about whether you should prefer your brother or your sister to yourself or whether you should treat them equal to yourself. Um, the the more the Sufis tend to say prefer them over yourself, but I mean maybe that's too demanding. I don't know. Um, So yeah, so he has here an istibshar, one farah that you you are pleasant when you see them, that you try to bring them good shears, you you don't depress them. You, you know, I would do very badly on that count because I depress people. Um, you ask about them, um, you worry about them. Okay, third. Uh, Hakulisan means basically that you don't slander them, you don't spy on them, and you don't speak ill of them. Is that okay? Is it that what I'm hearing? I'm not sure yet. 
Uh, okay. Force. Force shouldn't be separate, right? Um, yeah, for, it, it's it's a it's a, that, that's what, that's why they they usually are seven or six. Uh, yeah, because it's he splits the the rights of the tongue to into three and four, but it's really under all the same category that um, you don't speak ill of them. That um, so okay. Five, um, alaf, that, that's classic, that forgiveness, to overlook their faults and to be gentle with their faults, not to be judgmental. Um, and to think carefully about how to advise them without embarrassing them. So, okay, the rest is pretty typical. Um, but to be honest with them at the same time, six is dua, that you pray for them. That's fairly standard. Seven, uh, loyalty, that you continue to love them even as they go through the ups and downs of life. And what is normally listed as seven or eight, depending on who you're reading, um, oh, here he states it as yeah, normally it's uh, what, what it's stated as you don't ask too much or you don't demand of them more than they can bear um, so that while you think of how to make their life better but at the same time you are not dumping you're not dependent on them you're not dumping your problems on them uh, here he says Tark at taklif wa takalluf, which is a little bit different. That um, that you don't burden them, and at the same time you are um, that you don't uh, um, demean them that you don't demand of them that they be that be, they belittle themselves before you which is probably from here yeah, the because that's a bit unusual but anyway um among the 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 interesting things that emerge from our tradition and of course you, you know you can read that's a genre of literature that um, when I um, uh, were in the, I spent, as you guys know, my most of my experience in in among Islamic centers was with the Islamic Center of Southern California, and I was just truly amazed that during the entire time that I would go attend youth group meetings, uh, and I don't think the Islamic Center was an exception, I think it's the rule. All the times I've attended the youth group meetings, I've never heard a single time anyone discuss anything about what the Islamic tradition had to say about sisterhood or brotherhood. I mean, I would hear people say brother in Islam, sister in Islam, but it was all shooting from the hip. It was all like whatever people just thought it is. But not even what the Prophet said, not even the Hadith, not even, um, which of course, as a result, we all grew up with very screwed up, or, or I mean, I longed for a relationship with most of the people that 
I grew up with, and it was horribly screwed up as we all grew up. And of course, at the end, uh, it didn't end well, as all, some of all of you know. You know, been banned by them. Um, and my my dear brothers in Islam, you know, did nothing. Cause, but anyway. Uh, you know, our, uh, the wonderful ways we betray our tradition is endless. But this literature is available. I mean, it, some of it is translated, like the the chapter in Alum Din, and some of it can be translated. It's it's you know not difficult to find texts. Uh, is, most of them are written by from the Sufi esque perspective. Okay. Uh, if you notice, where from seventy one to about seventy seven, we we've talked about the ayat about Jannah and the difference between traditional approaches to um, to the pleasures of Jannah versus Sufi esque approaches, but. Uh, and here from 71 to about 77 um, it go it first touches briefly upon Jannah and then touches briefly upon Hellfire as typical but What's interesting, because of the nature of Surah Al-Zukhruf, which inshallah in the second part I'll talk about, um, the, the, the Sufi asked the Fasir, say that what you get in Jannah is in according to what your nature is and what you long for. So they explicitly and very bluntly say that if the joy of your existence is to no come to know the truth of things and to gaze upon the light of the divine, then that is what you are treated to in Jannah. But if you are a covetous human being who cares only about material things, then that's your reward in Jannah. But as I was reviewing the notes, I was reminded of something that, subhanAllah, I, I had completely forgotten, you know, when, um, that what they what is often cited in this debate or this back and forth between the traditional and Sufi esque is the hadith, um, the the so called horse hadith. A, a man goes to the 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 Prophet and he says, "I like horses, so will I have horses in Jannah?" And the Prophet. Uh, says yes you will so it says but okay but I like sheep well I like to herd sheep well I have sheep to herd in Jannah and the prophet says yes you will um, and then he asked something else I don't remember what it was but so the prophet says you will have what you covet that I that hadith and few other reports like it becomes center stage. It is the traditional approach say, well, Allah will create a horse for that man. Sufi asked the Fasir, and especially the later Sufis, um, say it is whether Allah will create a material horse or not is the wrong question. 
but it is the perception of having a horse that's the right question. That to say the fruit are fruit or the honey is honey is very short-sighted. And that's the, a, a genre of literature um, that interestingly, even among the, the, um, the, the more popular Sufis nowadays, the, the, it's a part of the tradition that they don't emphasize. Okay. Um, as to the people in hell, Notice here, when 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 I uftar one whom 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 fihi mublasun that they that they are in hell and they are uh, suffering the consequences of their misdeeds, and وَمَا ظَلَمْنَاهُمْ وَلَكِنْ كَانُوا هُمْ أَظْلَالِمِينَ that this is seventy six. We have not been unjust to them. They've been unjust. To themselves, ونادوا يا مالك ليقضي علينا ربك قال إنكم ماكثون. They will then plead to God to end their lives, and God say, "No, you will stay." That sparked another debate, and you you might be you might be asking the question that I asked many years ago: Why Surah Al-Zukhruf sparked all these debates? And I will come to that in the second part, because I don't think the traditional Shafi'i provide an answer. Um, but that sparked another debate. Okay, so they will say. We want to die, and God will say, "No, you will remain." Do this area became center stage again in the debate as to whether the punishment of hellfire is eternal or not eternal. Um, whether they expatiate their sins and eventually come out of hellfire. Um, Isharani has some stuff that uh, is really interesting. He, um, he talks about how, he talks about, I, I don't want to get it, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying he's correct, but I'm, uh, because I, I'm not, prepared to, to defend that controversial position if someone, um, and I don't know what I think about it, but he talks about moral growth in hellfire, that you can go to hell and you can grow morally until you become better than some people in Jannah, which for the modern, for modern Muslims, it will cause them, um, I don't know, epileptic, epileptic fits. Um, I mean, it's worth discussing, you know. Okay, we need to pray Maghrib, but um, hold on, just give me one minute. I want to see how much is left after Maghrib. Okay, so inshallah, we'll, we'll pray Maghrib. What time is it now? Okay, we'll pray Maghrib. Then after Maghrib, I will take 10 minutes to finish the surah. Traditional approach. We'll have to leave my approach, which is the, I, I guess the whole point, because... I wasn't doing this for the traditional approach, but we have to leave the way I approach this. Uh, I understand the surah till Tuesday. Unfortunately, I hope this is, doesn't become a sunnah because we can't afford to have 
surah take two halakhas. Because if that's happening with this surah, what's going to happen with Baqarah and Ali Umran? And how are we going to finish the Quran in a year? Um, this is where we make the divine time. <laughs> I don't know. Um, we don't have to finish it in one year. Are you saying we don't have to finish it in one year? I'm saying, I think... We can't be... afford not to finish it in one year. <laughs> it will be impossible to finish it in one year. Unless we start doing three or four halakhas a week. Okay, we're, we're going to pray Maghrib. Don't go anywhere. Don't run away. Okay, so... Um, I, I remember just one thing about... Um, among the the dynamics that would, that would go on between the Meccans and the Prophet um, uh, and, and this is in the context of uh, um in, in the same context about Ibn Zubari, the the um, around verse fifty seven when uh, um, talking about Jesus and the the response is that um, some of the Meccans would say would respond or criticize or react to the Islamic message by saying that Muhammad wants us to worship him like the Jesus, like the Christians worship Jesus. Um, it, it's among the things that you just find in the tradition. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's interesting that, that that rhetorical point was, was there. Um, because the, the Quran repeatedly rejects the deification of the of the prophet um, but it gives you a sense of how intense the rhetorical opposition to the prophet was um, okay um, so I think we left off at 77. Yeah, the where they are, they ask God to end their lives. So, and then what we notice in the balance of Surat um, Zuhruf that there are. It seems to go back to responding to the Meccans, but um, while affirming that most of them will not follow the Prophet ﷺ. Um, so, وَلَقَدْ جِئْنَاكُمْ بِالْحَقِّ وَلَكِنْ أَكْثَرُكُمْ لِلْحَقِّ كَارِهُونَ This is the truth that most of you reject it. Um, this is 78. Then a reference, أَمْ يَحْسَبُونَ أَنَّا لَا نَسْمَعُ صِرَّهُمْ وَنَجْوَاهُمْ بَلَا وَرْسُلُنَا لَدَيْهِمْ مَكْتُبُونَ There is a, a, a report that um, I forgot who it was among the Meccans that were slandering the Prophet and then they, they, they wandered uh, between them whether God would hear what they're saying about the Prophet behind his back. Although that, that report, I mean, uh, whether that's an occasion for a revelation is doubtful. Uh, but the comment about 
that Allah hears the the conversations between people right before قُلْ إِنْ كَانَ لِلْرَحْمَانِ وَلَدٌ فَأَنَا أَوَّلُ الْعَابِدِينَ that if indeed the God had a son that it would make sense if that is true that then you would be the first to worship the son of God um, it seems like a, 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 from the traditional approach at, at least to the to Surah Al-Zukhruf that it is sort of a, a jumps from one point to another responding to various rhetorical points made by the Meccans. Um, one of the interesting things about the verse uh, 81 is that for some reason this troubled a lot of traditional mufassirun. Um, the fact that the Quran would say, if indeed God had a, 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 um, an offspring that, that I would be the first to worship the offspring. Although it's clear, it's a rhetorical point because God doesn't have an offspring and the Quran itself is what says so. But for some reason, a lot of traditional Fasirun went out of their way to say that this is not what it's saying. That, um, and they give it, they give it rather tortured interpretations. Um, because for some reason they thought that this conceded a point. Um, I've never understood that. I mean, it, the language itself seems to be clearly saying what it reads, like it's saying uh, that if in fact God had an offspring, that of course that would be worthy of worship, but God doesn't have an offspring. Uh, let me, what is, how does the Sadiq Quran translate this? Yeah, they, they translated the, the, in more the, the Sufi-esque style of translating it. Okay. The, um, I don't have anything to say about uh, 82, or 83. Um, actually, I mean, the, the, from the traditional perspective, there is not much that I can add about the balance until we get to 88 um, and 89, the last two verses. وَقِيلِهِ يَا رَبْ إِنَّ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ فَاصْفَحْ عَنْهُمْ وَقُلْ سَلَامْ فَسَوْفَ يَعْلَمُونَ فَقُلْ سَلَامٌ فَسَوْفَ يَعْلَمُونَ That ultimately the, the entreaty, the, the entreating complaint, um, God, these people will not believe. And so forgive them. And what's interesting here is the expression not turn away for, from them, but فَصْفَحَنْهُمْ Forgive them. Um, this, of course, generates a long discussion, especially in the traditional approaches, because it is often the Quran says, that turn away from them, but forgive them 
with that abrogated by the later jihad verses. So that's the first debate, the abrogation. But even if it's ab not abrogated, did it really mean forgive them? So you should not have any in your heart um, a anger or bitterness towards them. And you can probably guess that the Sufi asked Tafsir say, yeah, it, it means we forgive them, meaning that this is not a personal issue. They don't deny you because of who you are it is because of problems within themselves. And so whether God forgives them or not, the standing, your standing position as the standing position of, for in the Sufi Astafasir, of, of every person who walks the path of Allah towards those who refuse to accept them and or follow them or believe them is forgiveness, not anger, not bitterness. The traditional tafsir had a problem with the idea of forgiveness because they said, how could it be that the prophet is told to forgive them when in just a couple of years or a year, depending on when they thought Surah Al-Zukhraf was revealed, um, there will be war between them. There will actually be a violence. And the Sufi asked Nafasi respond to this and say that even, especially if you go to war against them, especially if you go to war, you must clear your heart of any anger or bitterness because it's very dangerous to go to war with anger or bitterness because then if they say ashhadu an la ilaha illallah in the last second your anger might drive you to kill them anyway um a lot of the traditional tafsir don't seem to be too sympathetic to that point uh, they, they, they often say, well, you need anger for effective war, uh, which is more the, the pragmatic thing. Um, and of course, I don't believe in, in, the, in the thesis that this is abrogated by the later jihad verses. Um, But it makes sense if you understand Surah Al-Zukhruf. So we now have a set of questions. So we said that this is among the Hawameen, and so it's among the foundational Surah, but it's a late revelation. And if you notice in the traditional Tafsir, we sort of move from one point to another, the, the the surah opens up by talking about um, this, a reference to Umm Kitab, a reference to this being the Quran being an Arabic revelation a clear book, a reference to the mother of the book, and then an, a, a addressing the perceived privilege of the wealthy, um, and yet the, the continuing denial of the Prophet ﷺ the claims about the daughters of God, the this point about God only having daughters, um, the claims about well, it, worshiping of offspring of God is 
they're worshiping uh, is the idea of 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 uh, well before we get to Jesus, we the dealing with the issue of monotheism and the corruptions of monotheism, talking about Moses, then talking about Jesus, talking about Jesus, talking about Ibrahim, and then coming back to talk about the 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 criticisms of the Meccans and the denials of the Meccans, but it doesn't give us a sense of does this surah have a central theme? It seems to move from one point to another point. And so a lot of the traditional commentators and the Sufi S commentators say, well, you know, what it does is that it consoles the Prophet. That it is consoling the Prophet in dealing with the criticisms of, in the various criticisms that he confronts. But that is, Tasliyat al Rasul is what Quranic commentators often say when they don't get the point. <laughs> that, okay, it's just consoling the Prophet when they just don't, can't figure it out. Um, what time is it now? Oh, no. Um, so it's ten thirty three. So I'm going to have to give you the answer, which is my approach on Tuesday. Sorry. Uh, l less people rebel, and I mean, I l yeah, less people rebel, and and even. The, the the very valuable small audience that I have be evaporated thin air. So, but, but very valuable. Small, but very valuable. Just keep that in mind. Um, okay, so t Tuesday we'll, we'll, we'll do the other approach. And it's not, uh, because one of the questions that was asked, it's not line by line. I'm not going to go through the surah line by line. I'm going to deal with it thematically um, to demonstrate the point. Okay, uh, Grace, come close, do the honors. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you too soon. Okay. Well, we were thinking of revolting here. We were trying to decide whether we should push to go all the way through to the end. Um, but then we got the sense that the, the Sheikh was already rushing as it is, and we don't want to lose anything. So hopefully on Tuesday we will have enough time to... Also, you know, sometimes he'll remember things over the weekend. So maybe we'll pick up some things that we didn't get this time through. Um, and then we'll have time for a and a So even though it is a cliffhanger, and I, I know I feel very unsettled not knowing the answer, inshallah, um, to be continued, like every good episode of a great movie. <laughs> so um, have a wonderful weekend, everybody, and um, keep your questions if you have any. So, um, and yeah, so we'll, we'll do, do Q&A. Okay. Actually, I, if I could ask just one question which is unrelated to the Sora, because someone asked this, and I think there's a time element to it. This is totally unrelated. Sorry, sorry shifting gears really quickly. Somebody asked about um, praying, uh, sorry, fasting for um, the month of Shawwal, and whether it was okay to fast, like if you have to make up pray, uh, make up fasting, are you supposed to make those up first before you do the extra ones, <laughs> or do they? Or is there a double? Is there a question? No. All your horses. Um, um, or a do, did you say if you can, if they double count? Double, double, knee, double knee and double intention. Double intention. Two for one special. Two for one special. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the, unfortunately, uh, everyone that I've read uh, would say no to the double count theory. Um, did, you, did you get that? <laughs> you hear that? Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> she was trying to pretend she didn't hear it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the double count theory wouldn't work.
Um, and the, the probably the more correct opinion is that you can fast the, um, the days in Shawwal following the Sunnah uh, before making up the, the there, there is a minority opinion that says no you have to make up and Sunnah doesn't count until you make up the days that you've missed but um, it, it, the, the evidence is not as convincing um, the 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 you, you can fast the sunnah before you make up the days, um, but you can't double count. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Jenna. And actually, it wasn't what, my question. What, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't Jenna's question. Um, and then actually, one last thing. Sorry to go back. So to... since you didn't ask, it doesn't count for you. <laughs> oh. Like, yeah, it's like not, not watching the movie that prevents you from eating fish, right? Um, that, what I, I meant to ask this last Q&A, and sorry, I forgot, for Kama, do we know what the vicar was? Do you know if we got it? Yeah, I'm pretty sure he told us. Okay, I wasn't sure, I didn't have it in my notes. We got it? Okay. That's it. Thank you. So, someone, someone adopt sort of the Kama. <laughs> Inshallah, we have thirty surahs that have been adopted, and some, some like. That are you have thirty. You still have ninety. That's, that's oh, still you still have a hundred. hundred and four. Hundred and fourteen. Minus thirty. Eighty-four. Right. Oh, that's right. Uh, what am I thinking of? Okay. <laughs> Come on, people. So eighty-four orphans still. Yeah, eighty-four orphans. Right? Oh my lord. Okay. So, alrighty. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, everybody. Salam alaikum. Thank you for being with us. This was a long, long, thing, long, long evening, and uh, thank you for staying with us. We didn't have many breaks, but we will see you inshallah on Tuesday. Have a great weekend. Salam alaikum.